Hello, my name is Barbara Leland, and I am the I do the healthy eating classes here at uh, Hogue Cancer Center, and I'm a certified holistic health coach in Huntington Beach. So glad you're here with me, and today we're going to talk about a subject which um, I'm sure you've heard a lot about. We're going to talk about the microbiome, and there's so many words floating around that, at least in my in my realm of reality, I get all these articles about different uh, microbiome and bacteria and gut and this and that, and it can be overwhelming. And there's so many words that we're not really used to. So today we're going to find out what it is we're talking about when we're talking about the microbiome. So what the heck is it? First, let's break down the word. So biome is a noun, and it means a large area that supports flora and fauna that interact with each other, so like the rainforest. The rainforest supports the animals and the plant life that would live within that area, and they, they all interact together and support each other. Um, that's biome. Micro means very small, as we know, very small. So microbiome is the collection of very small organisms, uh, living organisms in an environment that is, in what we're talking about today, that is the body or parts of the body. So that's microbiome. And so what we're talking about is the human microbiome, and the body is made up of half, almost half, human cells and a little bit more than half microbial cells. So you would think that the body's just made up of human cells, but no, they're not. It's not. It's, there's a lot of other living organisms that are within our body. And um, in, in our body, in our microbiome, our human microbiome, we have areas of microbiomes. So for example, we have the respiratory tract, which has 600, over 600 species of uh, microbial cells. We have the skin microbiome, which has a thousand species, and the gut, which is 500 to a thousand species of um, uh, microbes. And there's other microbiomes as well, but these are the ones we're going to talk about today. And so it's interesting that it's not just human cells that it's making up our body. And really, it is a balancing act. So when the optimal it should be is that our microbiome and all the organisms within our body are in balance. When they're in balance, they help us thrive. When that balance gets tipped over and the bad bacteria overtakes the good or is larger than the good, that's when we have health problems. So we want to keep our microbiome in balance. And what, what affects that? How, how do we keep it in balance? Well, what affects it is um, your food, so what you eat and drink, how well and how much you sleep, exercise or lack or, the, or that you do have it, stress, how we manage it, the environment, what's coming in from the outside, medications, smoking, drugs and alcohol, and genetics. Some of these things we can, um, and more than that as well, but some of these things we can ha um, control some of them we cannot. And the microbiome can be affected positively or it can be affected negatively. So for example, the skin microbiome. When it's in balance, it guards against uh, bad bacteria and pathogens. It heals wounds. It limits exposure to allergens. And it minimizes oxidative damage. So that's all good. But when it's out of balance, there's possible situations that can arise, uh, one of these being skin cancer, others being uh, eczema or psoriasis, um, acne, allergies, uh, things like that, um, accelerated skin aging. Okay, so that's when your skin microbiome is out of balance. And things that may cause it to be out of balance, so things that affect your skin microbiome. So remember, we have these organisms on our skin that are protecting us, okay, all over our body. So ultraviolet waves from the sun, that can damage that microbiome, 
and let in the uh, damaging effects, okay? So then you'd say, well, okay, Barbara, I'm going to wear sunscreen, but it shows down here on my right-hand side, down the bottom, sunblock is one of the things that can negatively affect our skin microbiome. So what are you supposed to do? Well, I'm not saying don't wear sunscreen. I'm not saying that at all. But know what's in your sunscreen. So um, there is a website that I know I've mentioned a number of times, and I'm going to mention it again. It's Environmental Working Group. It's ewg.org. And that is a website that you can look up. Not only do they talk about organics and pesticides, et cetera, that's who does the Clean 15, Dirty Dozen, but also they talk about um, uh, ingredients in our cosmetics, household products, things like that. So that's where you can look up your sunscreen and see how it measures up. Is it safe or is it not? Um, other things that you want to be careful of, this woman down on the left-hand side in the bottom, she's putting toxins all over her face every time she puts on her makeup. She doesn't know that, but again, same website. You can check your ingredients on that website. I think it's called Skin So Deep, but it's through Environmental Working Group. Um, and you can get the link through their website, ewg.org. And uh, I have no affiliation with them, I just really uh, like what they have available for us. And um, so be careful with your cosmetics. Also, uh, your body products, your shampoos and um, body creams and body washes, things like that. Check your ingredients. Make sure that what you're putting on your skin is good for your skin. You don't want to damage that microbiome. And then lastly, this last... Uh, year and a half or even more now, we have been going crazy with antibacterial soap um, and antibacterial wipes, and rightfully so. You know, we've had a lot to worry about. But you want to be careful. A good soap and water, just nice, clean soap and water will do the trick. You don't need the antibacterial soap because remember that that antibacterial is not just killing the bad bacteria, it's also affecting your good bacteria. So you want to be careful with that. I understand use it uh, if you have to, if you're someplace and that's all there is available, but you can buy um, uh, products that you can take with you that are not antibacterial but will also fight the germs, okay? So these are the things that can affect your skin microbiome negatively. Then the respiratory tract. So we have another microbiome in our respiratory tract. And in balance, it helps us with our immune system. It prevents lung disease. And um, it guards against airborne infections, as well as some of those airborne uh, chemicals that may have, you know, like when you're using your body soap in the shower and it's bad stuff, you know, the steam of the shower, you're inhaling it as well as it going through your skin. So think of that as well. Um, so, but it does help uh, when it's in balance, it helps protect against things like that. When it's out of balance, again, one of the things that is a possible situation is cancer. Um, bronchitis, emphysema, asthma, pneumonia, things like that, COPD. Um, so we want to make sure that our respiratory tract is in balance and what can throw it out of balance? You know, number one, smoking, right? Um, if you smoke, quit. Uh, if you don't smoke, don't ever start. And then we have other things that we don't have as much control over, such as pollution. If you uh, live in a polluted area, you know, um, you have to be careful as much as you can. You have to do things that support your microbiome. And then also on top, now I'm not saying that watching TV uh, is bad for your respiratory tract microbiome, but perhaps watching other people exercise when you're not exercising could be bad for your microbiome because you want to have that airflow going. So you want to be exercising, not necessarily watching other people exercise, um, or at least do your exercise before or after you sit down on the couch. Okay, these are things that can affect your microbiome. And then in the house, you know, we have our safe haven and 
there are so many things that can affect our respiratory tract and the microbiome that's in our respiratory tract in our home. So um, be careful when you're installing new carpets, uh, granite counters, things, all kinds of things that you put in your home, they do off-gas. New furniture, they do off-gas. So you want to be careful with that. Make sure you know what you're getting. And then things that uh, you're, you're using like air fresheners or scented candles or uh, perfume or syn synthetic scents, all of those things will affect your respiratory microbiome. So um, in your home, you want to be careful as well as outside your home. And now we're going to talk about the gut microbiome, which is really what we're here about today. So the gut microbiome, in balance, it, it's, what it does is the, the, all the, the microbes in your body, in your gut, they absorb the nutrients and then they produce vitamins from the foods that they're absorbing the nutrients from and distribute it throughout your body. So it's able to be distributed throughout your body. So that is a huge function for your gut microbiome. Um, also, your brain function, we'll talk a little bit more about this later. Your digestion, because it's, you know, good digestion comes from a balanced microbiome. Your immune system is hugely affected by your gut microbiome. Um, uh, good, a good balance, a good diversity of, of uh, microbes in your gut will protect against the growth of harmful bacteria. And also it helps regulate blood sugar. So um, you want to keep your gut in balance because out of balance, there's so many different things that it can affect, as you can see from this list. Again, one of them being cancer. Um, and a number of these things also we've already talked about with the respiratory, but what happens is, and we're going to talk more about this, but it's, it has to do with your immune system a, a lot. And your gut microbiome affects your immune system so much, and your immune system protects you against many of these types of disease. So keep your, keeping your gut, microbi your gut microbiome in balance really, really is important for your whole body, okay? And so the, the, the good bacteria the, in your microbiome, they, like I said, they, they take the nutrients from the food from, and they digest the foods that are otherwise indigestible by our own enzymes. And they are able to then harvest the energy and deliver the nutrients throughout our body, okay? And then the brain-gut connection. <laughs> what happens in the gut doesn't stay in the gut. So when your gut microbiome is out of balance, that can lead to anxiety, uh, depression and um, stress, poor sleep. Also, oppositely or conversely, <laughs> anger, anxiety, sadness, stress, depression, all of those can cause a disruption in your gut microbiome. So it's like this picture shows a telephone. When you're talking on the telephone, you're sending out your voice, but you're also receiving. So it's a two-way conversation between the brain and the gut. And what happens in the brain affects your gut. What happens in the gut affects your brain. Interesting. And they're even finding, there's new studies that are being done that they're even finding that probiotic um, treatment can help with depression. So there's a very strong connection, and it's called actually called the brain-gut axis. axis. And um, so you want your, your gut to be in balance to protect your brain, but you also want your brain to be in balance. So things that stress you out, um, try to learn to deal with the stress in a positive way or avoid the stress if you can. Um, we'll go on further with that. So immunity, and 70% of your immune system is in your gut. So immunity really does start in the gut, okay? When it's in balance, when your gut is in balance, your micro, microbiome in the gut, um, the immune system supports the beneficial microbes, the beneficial bacteria that's in your gut. When it's out of balance or when the bad bacteria overtakes the good bacteria, there's, it sends out a signal to your body that there's a threat. 
And that threat causes your immune system to react. The reaction of your immune system is inflammation. Now, when you cut yourself and it swells up or you break your bone and, or strain something, you hurt yourself somehow, you're gonna have swelling, right? That is your body sending all of the healing to that area. And so it, it protects it by getting inflamed. Same thing happens in your system. When there is a threat in your system, your body reacts with inflammation. That's fine, and that helps, that does what it's supposed to do, it protects us. But when it's on and on and on, when the threats continue, then inflammation continues and inflammation becomes chronic. And chronic inflammation causes disease. So. Knowing this and knowing that 70% of your immune system is in your gut, it's very important to support your gut microbiome. Okay, you wanna, it's, you wanna keep your uh, biome in balance and that will help support your immune system. Okay, and I see we have a question. You can ask questions. Thank you. You can ask questions as we're going along. Um, and I'll try to get to them unless I'm like really on a roll and then I'll wait. But here we go. Is there an affordable, accurate test to determine a person's microbiome state? Um, ye, I don't know. You can check with your doctor on that. I really don't know the answer if there's an affordable, accurate test for that. So you can check with your doctor on that. Um, but some of the things that can tell you, you know, without checking, without going through that, is if you're having any of the symptoms that we've already discussed, that's a kind of a good um, indicator that your microbiome might be out of balance. So be aware of your, your own body and what's happening and how you're feeling about things or what's happening, you know, and that can give you an idea. As far as that, check with your doctor and they can let you know about that. Are over-the-counter probiotics effective? We're gonna talk about that and I'll get to that as in a little bit later. How to choose the right one for you. And again, I'll try to come back to that. Why can't the FDA regulate supplements? Um, why can't the FDA regulate supplements? Well, it's, I don't know. I don't know why the FDA can't regulate. They are regulated other places in the world. So are essential oils. There's a number of things that I that the FDA can or cannot do, and I don't have the answer for that one, actually. Um, I have a lot of theories, but you probably don't want to hear that. Um, anyway, let's go on. So blood sugar, they have found that when someone has diabetes, one or two, their diversity of micro microbes in their gut they have low diversity. So you can see with this picture all the blue, that means one type of um, microbe is overtaking the others, it's overgrowing the others. When it's a normal um, situation, no diabetes, there's high diversity. So there's a number of different microbes going on. So it's, again, it's um, for diabetes number two, out of balance gut health, can lead to impaired glucose tolerance, which can lead to insulin resistance or diabetes too. Diabetes one, as we know, is a genetic situation and um, not necessarily caused by diet, but it's important for you to know this because if you have diabetes one, you can, you can, uh, you can see that your uh, diversity of your microbiome is low. So what you want to do is even more so you want to support your microbiome by making sure you increase the diversity and increase the good bacteria in your microbiome. So number two, you can actually, um, with your diet, you can affect, your microbiome can affect your blood sugar and cause, and you'll have low diversity in your microbiome. Number one, the diabetes number one itself will cause a, a reaction in your gut microbiome to have low diversity. Either way, either way, you want to support your microbiome um, with good, with good um, bacteria, okay? So that's what I have to say about the blood sugar. 
So what are some of the negative influences on the gut microbiome? Ones we've already talked about, like the pollution, the smoking, alcohol. Did we already talk about alcohol? I don't think so. But the sm smoking and the pollution and stress, all of those things can affect not just your, um, your respiratory microbiome, but also your gut microbiome. And then on top of that, we have uh, drugs and alcohol. Those things can affect your microbiome. Um, sugar, it, neg these are negative, by the way, negatively affects your microbiome. Uh, and when I say negatively affects your microbiome, what I'm talking about is that it's going to reduce the diversity and lower the good bacteria, okay? Uh, sugar, uh, oils that are not good oils, not good fats, such as um, processed oils like corn oil and uh, highly processed canola oil, things like that. Also, um, you know, saturated fats like in steak and uh, meat and cheese and butter and bacon. All those things can, can adversely affect your microbiome. So you do want to be careful, especially if you're, you know, a lot of people are doing a higher fat diet, um, low carbs, and you do want to be careful about your microbiome there, okay? And then lastly, not quite lastly, but on this screen lastly, we have antibiotics, other drugs as well, but and other medications. And what I'm talking about here are excessive antibiotic use. So <clears throat> I'm not saying that if you need an antibiotic, you shouldn't have it. I'm not saying that at all. What I am saying is make sure that when you're getting an antibiotic, that's something you really do need. Uh, we know, I don't know that it's happening so much anymore, but it used to be that there was excessive use of antibiotics. Um, people would demand them and then doctors would comply and things like that. I don't think that's happening as much anymore, but when you take antibiotics or if you have to have medication, be aware that you need to even more support your microbiome, okay? Um, excuse me. Um, the microbiome can return to normal after taking medications. So uh, also, cancer treatment, that can affect your um, microbiome. So you want to be supportive. You want to not do the other things that could adversely affect your microbiome even more so when you're taking medications, okay? And you want to do things that will support, and we're going to talk about that. So here we go. So positive influences on the microbiome. So finally, uh, We'll go away from the doom and gloom and talk a little bit about uh, the positive things that we can do to support our microbiome. So probiotics, which I know you've heard of and probably have questions about, I know you have questions about probiotics. Uh, fiber, a diet high in fiber will support your microbiome. Um, uh, vegetables, fruits and vegetables supports your microbiome. Good sleep. And we've talked before in other seminars about how to make sure we get good sleep and what affects our sleeping patterns. And I'm not going to go into all that today because we're already, it's already getting later than it might be. Um, but just do know that if you're not sleeping well, that does affect your microbiome. So you want to do things that will help your sleep. By the way, if there is a seminar that you've missed and you'd like to go back and see it, um, you can go, I know the Hogue channel has the seminars up, but it might be a little difficult to find. So on my website, and I'll give you the um, address at the end, you can go to my website and look under videos and all of them are listed there and you can just click on the link and it'll take you right to the YouTube video. Okay. And then exercise, as we said before, that was for the respiratory, but it's also for the, um, the gut microbiome. The exercise will help your gut microbiome as well. So high in plant fiber, prebiotic, prebiotics, probiotics, um, exercise, sleep, staying away from as much as possible uh, pollution and um, environmental uh, toxins, um, smoking, of course, alcohol, all those things you want to, you know, stay away from as much as possible and increase 
these items to support your microbiome. So again, how do we support a healthy microbiome? What are probiotics and prebiotics and blah, 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 and symbiotics? What the heck is a symbiotic? All these words come out at us, you know, flying out of the internet. And sometimes you think you know what they're talking about, sometimes you think you don't. And this is just to break it down a little bit so we have a little bit better understanding of what these things are. So prebiotics, that is actually, um, prebiotics are actually food for bacteria. They feed the good bacteria in our microbiome. So there are substances that can only be metabolized by the gut bacteria and not by your body. And they provide nour nourishment for the actual bacteria in your body. Okay, they're not the bacteria itself. They're not a probiotic. They're a prebiotic. So they support the bacteria in your system. Probiotics uh, are actually live bacteria that you're putting into your body, good bacteria, and they're active bacterial cultures. And they, of course, have good effects for you. And they fight the harmful bacteria that exist in the gut, okay? So we have prebiotics that feeds the good bacteria, and we have probiotics that increases the good bacteria. And then we have symbiotics. So I don't know if you've heard of this term or not, but symbiotics are a combination of the two. So when you have something that is a prebiotic and a probiotic, synergy means the working together of two things to produce an effect greater than the sum of their individual effects. So these two things come together and they are actually even more powerful than they would be on their own. So that's what symbiotics are. And examples of prebiotics, which again nourish the probiotics, are all these vegetables I've listed here, these fruits, and then other algae, which would be like spirulina, uh, chia seeds, um, seaweed, etc. These things are prebiotic, okay? And you might, you have uh, this, you should have gotten this um, um, PowerPoint sent to you if you had registered. If you did not register, the PowerPoint should be below. You should be able to see a link below the YouTube and uh, you can click on that and you can save it so you can come back to this. You don't have to be frantically making notes. I should have told you that before, sorry. Um, anyway, so these are prebiotics, and again, these are types of foods that are not, the, there's portions of these foods that are not digestible by your body, by your enzymes, but the, but the bacteria eats them up and um, you, uses that energy for your system, okay? Those are prebiotics. They nourish the probiotics. Probiotics are Probiotics are um, fermented foods. Fermented food sources are probiotic. Those are live, good bacteria. So we have a number of different things here. Some of you you've heard of, and some of them you may not have. Uh, curtido is a Salvadoran type of sauerkraut. So I personally don't care for sauerkraut too much. Maybe some of you do, but I uh, do like curtido, which is something that we're going to be making next week. I'm going to show you how to ferment your own curtido, and it, you'll, it's pretty easy. So it's a way to get a fermented food into your system that's pretty tasty because it's got a lot of Latin flavors, which I happen to like better than sauerkraut. Uh, anyway, so curtido is, is uh, a fermented food source, as well as kefir, kimchi, which I know you've heard of. Um, which, what I understand, kimchi might be a little hard to make, maybe not hard, but kind of a long process. Uh, kombucha, which is a, a fermented tea. Uh, miso, which is fermented soybean paste. Uh, pickles, without vinegar, no vinegar. So certain things you may find in the store that are supposedly a fermented food, they, they may not say they're a fermented food, but you think, oh, pickles, that's fermented. Not necessarily. If it has vinegar in it, the vinegar will kill the, um, the good bacteria. 
So you want to make sure that if what you're buying pickles, you get the kind that does not have the vinegar, that they've actually been fermented on their own. Um, sauerkraut, same. I don't know that they make sauerkraut with just vinegar, but they might. You just want to make sure there's no vinegar included in that. Tempeh, yogurt, those are all fermented foods. And a note about tempeh. So tempeh, you saw it on my prebiotic list. It's also on the probiotic list, but it's only probiotic if it's raw. And honestly, I don't think, I've never seen raw tempeh, maybe at a raw food store, I'm not sure, um, but I've never seen raw tempeh in the store. So when it's cooked, it, it destroys the probiotic portion of it, but it is still, so it's not going to have, it's, it's not going to have the um, probiotic portion, but it does still have the prebiotic, and it still has good properties, because it is fermented, it still has good properties for digestion and inflammation, and it's a good protein source, too, if, um, if you do soy products. Okay, so those are probiotics, food source probiotics, and I'm going to look at some of these questions. Why don't doctors give you a probiotic after or during antibiotic treatment? Wouldn't this be helpful for res restoration of your microbiome? When I, if I get an antibiotic, I do, that is one time when I will use a, a probiotic, um, not, not just the food source, but an actual probiotic. Uh, some doctors will recommend that you take a probiotic. Some doctors don't. So it really depends on your doctor, okay? Yes, it's helpful re for restoring the microbiome, definitely. And how many hours apart should you take a probiotic supplement from taking an antibiotic? Um, uh, I think this, would, this could depend on your antibiotic, and you should check with your doctor on something like that. Uh, make sure they know that you're taking the probiotic and check with your doctor to see if you can take it at the same time, if it'll affect it at all. Um, best bet is to check with your doctor on something like that. Okay, let's go on. So. Uh, we already went over the probiotics, the live good bacteria. So now we're going to talk about symbiotics. And I, like I said, I don't know if you've heard about symbiotics before or not, but they um, combine, again, to be better than each of them would be separately. And some of the things that we already talked about in the probiotics are actually uh, symbiotic because they're made from foods that are prebiotic and then they're fermented. So you've got the uh, prebiotic portion of it, and then you've got the fermented portion of it, the probiotic portion. And so that makes that food symbiotic. So for example, the curtido is symbiotic, the kimchi, symbiotic, because it's made with the foods that are um, prebiotic. Pickles, sauerkraut, those are all symbiotic foods. Um, things that that you might have to combine to make a symbiotic food would be like uh, you take kefir and make a smoothie with strawberries and bananas, or you have your yogurt with bananas and berries. That turns that probiotic food into a symbiotic dish. Um, and then miso soup. So miso is a probiotic. And then you combine it with onions and bok choy, and that turns it into a, um, a symbiotic dish. But I just do want to mention on, on miso soup that when you, the, the directions on miso, I don't know if you eat miso or not, but I'm going to tell you this anyway. The directions on miso is that you take the miso and you put it into the water, the, and then you cook your vegetables and the broth at the same time. But that's not good for the fermentation, I mean for the probiotic. That kills the probiotic in the miso. So what you want to do when you make miso soup is you make your broth with your onions, your bok choy, whatever you're putting in there, and then take it off the heat. And you're going to have to kind of judge if you have a thermometer, that's great, um, but it, it's 115 is the um, degree that you want it to be at or less for the miso soup to not, for the miso to not be damaged by the heat. The miso won't be damaged. The miso is still good, but I'm talking about the probiotic aspect of it. So you just want to make sure you don't cook that miso uh, 
to keep it probiotic. OK, so again, uh, these are symbiotic foods, foods that are combined to make a pro, uh, symbiotic, prebiotic and probiotic food. So here we go with what about supplements? I do not have a lot of answers about how much you should have or which one is the best um, for supplements. And you might want to check with your doctor on that. But when you're talking about probiotics, which one would you really rather have? Would you rather have something that comes out of a lab or would you rather have something that grows on a tree? Kind of. Uh, probiotics don't grow on a tree, but you know what I'm saying. They come from uh, a situation that is natural. So I choose to have um, natural. I do not choose to have supplements. Again, unless there is a situation, I will take medication. I will take a supplement if something has gone to the point where I'm out of balance and I really have to do something to make myself back in balance. So. On a, to support my, my microbiome and to support my health, I will try to eat foods that are not supplements. But if something goes wrong, like I have to take an antibiotic or if I'm sick, then I may take a supplement at that point. Um, I'm not going to tell you because I'm not here to promote different products. If you want to talk to me individually about that, I can give you some information about what I use. But um, personally, I would rather go natural than take a supplement. And I hope that answers your questions um, as to whether or not over-the-counter probiotics effective. Yes, I think over-the-counter probiotics can be effective. I definitely think they can. And how to choose the right one for you that's something that you want to discuss with your doctor. It's too, it's too general. Uh, this is too general a forum to go through that. OK, so I hope that answered your question. If it didn't answer your question, please put it in the chat. So again, if you do decide to take a prebiotic or a probiotic, or they do have symbiotics now, too, in supplements, excuse me, do check with your doctor especially if you are going, undergoing chemotherapy or cancer treatment, or if you have a weakened immune system, if you have a critical illness, or you've recently had surgery. All these things, you know, no matter what you're doing, if you're going through anything out of the ordinary and you want to try not to treat yourself, uh, that's not, not treat yourself like ice cream, but I mean try not to um, diagnose yourself and then um, and then take something to fix it without talking to your doctor, OK? Uh, you want to know what you're doing. Uh, it, could, uh, it could be your doctor, or it could be another um, health uh, therapist. But you want to know what you're doing. And uh, there's so much confusing information out there. But especially if you're undergoing treatment, you do want to talk to your doctor about taking any supplements, not just prebiotic, probiotic, or symbiotic. So that was a lot of information. And I know we went past our half hour. And I apologize. But I hope that this was able, that you were able to get a better understanding of what the microbiome is and what it does for your body, and especially the gut microbiome. And um, next week, like I said, we're going to come back and we're going to make curtivo. And curtivo, I don't know if you know what pupusa is or um, it's a Salvadoran flat, like pancake kind of thing that they put this cortivo over. But I have found that may not be the healthiest thing to eat, this pupuso. It's very delicious, but it's not the healthiest. It has cheese and, you know, all that. But I have found that this cortivo goes great on tacos or on salad with avocado or anything like that. Um, um, it's very versatile, and especially if you like flavors like uh, red onions and cilantro and uh, things like that, then you'll enjoy this curtivo that we're going to make next week. And if you don't, you still might want to watch it because we can, you can tailor it to be whatever. The main goal here is to ferment 
this food. And it doesn't have to have certain things in it to do that. And we'll talk about that next week. So even if you don't like cilantro or red onions or those kind of flavors, you can tailor it to, to something that you do like, OK? And you'll still get the properties, the good properties. Do we have any more questions? OK, so that was kind of nice. We answered the questions while we were going along. And if you have questions later or you have a very specific question for yourself, you can email me at two life dash two health at hotmail.com. Um, or you can visit me on my website at www.twolife two health.com. And that's where I do have all the videos posted under on the home page. If you go down to the bottom, it says videos. Click on that and you'll see a listing of all the different YouTubes that we've done. Okay? So do your best, support your microbiome, be healthy, be happy, and I'll see you next week. Okay, thank you very much.